All right. Hello and welcome to another edition of Rust Lins. Hi, everybody. I think we're live. I think everything should work. Yeah, here we are. Cool. Um, I'm also putting Ryan on stage. Hello, Ryan. Hello, welcome to Hi, Stefan. Rust Lins. Uh, Happy New Year, by the way. I don't know if you're still allowed to say it, but it's our first meetup in 2024. A lot has happened last year, but we are back just in time, I think. Um, also, a quick shout out to our friends in Vienna. Uh, they have to meet up at the same time, so I guess they start in about 30 minutes. Um, and we synced, our, uh, we synced with each other that it's totally okay to run two meetups in the same area at the same time because they are doing it in person, we are doing it online, so everything's fine. But hello, everybody, to, to Rust Vienna. Uh, I'm looking forward to meet you at one of your upcoming editions. All right, speaking of Rust events, um, we have a couple of Rust-related news. So there are lots of events happening in the Rust uh, community, especially in Europe. There's Rust Nation coming up. It's the next conference, end of March, in London. The lineup is already announced. It looks fantastic. It's about three days' worth of content, workshops, trainings, talks, and um, um, uh, classroom live coding sessions. So it's going to be a real fantastic event at the Brewery in London, which is also a really nice place to be. Um, then just announced this week um, is uh, the next edition of the Rust Netherlands conference in 2024. It happens May 7 and 8. It's now a two-day event. It was a one-day event last time. And it happens in Delft, not in Amsterdam. At this time, um, also looking like a fantastic location. Really looking forward to this event. Um, Stefan Schindler from... From Zurich, you know, he was he was in Linz as well for for uh, quite some time. He now moved back to Switzerland, and with coming back to Switzerland, he's also doing another edition of Rastfest Zurich. After I don't know how many years, it's a huge event. It's about five days with hackathons, um, open source labs, workshops, talks. So they have a really great concept. You can find everything on the website rastfest.ch. And last but not least. Uh, there's already a date for Eurorust, not a location. This will be figured out soon, um, again in the first week of October. A couple of local events to Linz. The usual three suspects. Technology Blaustrell is happening again next week on, I guess it's Tuesday. Um, then we have the next Koto Dojo tomorrow, Rainer. I guess you're already prepared for what's happening yes, I with, am. with the kids. Yeah. And the female scholars are having the next lab at February 7 at the Wissens Tour in Linz. You can find them um, femalecoders.at, linz.coder.net, I guess. Yes. Exactly. And technologieblaschol.at. But we have a new meetup in town. And this is where I lead over to you, Rainer. It's the Linux and free and open source software meetup, which has happened. Absolutely. Last week. Absolutely. We are so, so happy. Um, you have to understand. Uh, at, a new meetup is not founded every day and this meetup is very very special to us because one the organizers are three young coders from a local school a technical school for computer science uh, and it's not every day that uh, young people decide that they spend their free time organizing a FOSS and Linux meetup. That's one thing that we already love. Second, uh, we had the chance to support them a little bit in the organization of their very first meetup. So again, something that we loved to do. But one, the third very special thing about this meetup is that one of the organizers was originally a child coming to Code Dojo. So his first uh, his first steps in coding and things like that were also done not just at home but inside of the Code Dojo. So he has grown up, he has become a real good coder and now he is not just part or at, at participating in a community, he's founding his first community. And I think these three things make this Linux meetup a very cool story that's going on here in Linz. And we are super proud that it worked perfectly. I think we were approximately 30 people at the first meetup. And yeah, we had we had a blast. It was really great content, great community. We loved it. The next Linux meetup will happen somewhere in spring, maybe April, May. We will see. It's up to the organizers, but they definitely loved the experience and they want to go on. I'm very happy to hear that. So it's it's great that um, young people are coming, joining the community, working actively in it. So I've, I've done community events in Linz for 10 years now, and it's great to see too that new people are coming. Absolutely fantastic. Alrighty, 
let's go to our event today. We have two talks. I'm incredibly happy that uh, Massimiliano is joining us today. Uh, Massimiliano um, is from Italy, from the town of Gorgonzola, as we found out um, before the event. Um, and I met him at Eurorust last year. Um, I, I gave my talk and afterwards, um, uh, during the Q&A, he came, we queued together for lunch and we chatted, I guess, it was a very long queue, there was little lunch, and we, we chatted the entire time and we found out that we have very similar interests in how we approach software development, how we approach software development in JavaScript and in, in, in Rust. Um, and I remembered that he is also very keen to speak at meetups, so I said, you know what? Massimiliano is coming to Rust Linz. Let's see if we can work out the talk. Um, and he put a lot of effort into it. Um, so I'm very happy that he's coming. He's talking about object-oriented programming and Rust to see how those two things can work together. And when I told Rainer that, you know, Massi is going to do his OOP talk, he said, oh, wait, another person at the OOP conference next week in Munich? Um, <laughs> no, it's actually a talk about object-oriented programming, not at the object-oriented programming uh, conference, but it's fun because Rainer then said, you know what, I'm going to, to bring in my OOP talk as well, which is not an OOP talk. It's a talk for the OOP conference, <laughs> but it makes a really nice, uh, a really nice uh, um, uh, lineup. So Rainer is talking, giving a new talk about memory management, um, and uh, Ryan is very interested to hear your feedback about this talk um, because um, it's brand new. He's premiering it at a conference next week, and the more feedback he gets, the better. So I'm really looking forward to hear what Ryan is coming up in his new talk. Okay, end with that. Um, you know, if you have any questions during the talks, just put them in the chat. I'm going to relay them to the speakers afterwards. Um, but with that, I want to pull down my slides and put up Massimiliano. Hi, Massi. Hi, welcome to Rust Linz. Hello, everyone. <laughs> How are you doing? I'm fine, I'm fine. It's, uh, well, half past 5 p.m. I stopped working, I'm relaxing, and I just do this talk and be happy. Cool. I'm really looking forward to your talk. I already got a sneak peek. Um, we are already, uh, we're also putting up the slides of your talk in the chat so people can follow you on their own screens if they like. Um, I already gave away where you're coming from, but usually we ask people, where are you Where are you calling in from? What's your home base? Where's your location? Oh, I'm based in a small town, uh, 20 kilometers east from Milano. It's a small town, so I have countryside near my house, but I also have uh, a metro station near my house, so I can be downtown in no time at all if I need, which is nice. It's a very good balance uh, as a place where to live. And I've always been here, so I was, was born near here, and oh, cool. it's just my place. Um, I never managed to get into that part of Italy, unfortunately. So I was down um, at, of course, Lago di Garda and, um, and uh, Firenze and, you know, um, in, in Tuscany. Uh, and I always wanted to go into that into that corner of Italy. Maybe maybe I will uh, sometime yeah. in the future. Then I yeah, but you already seen the nice things. This part of Italy is a huge flat land. Uh, full <laughs> of fog, often pollution, <laughs> lots of traffic. Milan oh, no, is don't, probably don't spoil it. Don't spoil it. So... There can't be a, there can't be a bad place in Italy. <laughs> <laughs> Alrighty, Massimiliano. Um, I'm very curious on about your talk. I'm really looking forward to it. I'm going to put up your slides in a second. Um, people in the chat, people who are live, please put up a round of virtual applause um, in the comments. And Massimiliano, thank you for coming. The stage is yours. So, thank you, everyone. Thank you, everyone. Today, we'll be talking about object-oriented programming and us, how they mix together and how they can work. First of all, why this talk? So, the point is that I really, really, really literally grew up with object-oriented programming, and I actually liked it. And then I decided to unlearn it after a while. And this talk explains the journey, what happened, what I was doing. And this is the journey, journey eventually I came to Rust. So things I worked on professionally. I worked on large embedded system, telecom which is stations, JIT compilers, Mono, V8 in Google, game engines inside Unity 3D, collaboratively, collaborative virtual reality on the web, distributed systems, blockchains and um, uh, distributed systems, which are, uh, let's say, eventually consistent. 
And now I'm working on operational research and logistics. So I did lots of things. I've seen lots of way to design software. And along this journey, I started mostly with C++. You have to think late 80s, early 90s. Then Java, C Sharp. And I was always thinking in terms of classes. And then I explored TypeScript, then Clojure, Haskell, OCaml, Go, Erlang. Now I work with Rust full time. And the point is that it took me decades to think differently. I was always thinking in terms of classes first, and now I think differently. And I want to explain what happened. And the point is why? Why did I decide, so to speak, to unlearn object-oriented programming? Is object-oriented programming bad? And the short answer is no, it's not. The principles are solid, and solid is an acronym which came from Robert Mar Martin, Uncle Bob, and stays for single responsibility principle, open closed principle, uh, least code substitution principle, interface segregation principle, and dependency inversion principle. I'm not going to describe them at length in this talk. Does, this is not a talk about the principles of object-oriented programming. I'm just saying the principles are good. If you follow these principles, design your software, the software will be maintainable, it will work well, that's fine. So, so the, if the principles are okay, what's wrong? And to understand what's wrong, we should understand what object-oriented really means. There are principles, yes, but there are practices and there are technologies. And the problem is that we usually get these things backwards. So in theory, you should start from principles and define your practices and design your technologies so that those practices work well, according to the principles. What we do is actually start from technologies, which are programming languages, development environments, tools, and in OP, object relational mappers, dependence injection frameworks. We start with the tools. And how do we write code? We are not critical. We take technical features and we just use them. Because for us, if a feature is there, it must be good. So the core issue is that in mainstream object-oriented languages and technologies, bad practices are actually encouraged by the tools. And those practices go actually against the good principles. And in my opinion, Rust is doing better. And so this is the gist of the talk. Let's start to think about problematic object-oriented practices. Often you end up with a jungle of dependencies, abstraction through inheritance, abuse of virtual methods. Then there is the new operator, which is a strange construct that gets in the way. Often it is very easy to leak references to internal state of things. And there is pervasive mutability everywhere. So the problem is that typically when you look at the object-oriented code in the field, you see all of these things. And let's see, let's see why they are wrong. Thinking about dependencies, there is Joe Armstrong, which is the creator of the Erlang programming languages, that made this quote. He says, you wanted a banana, but what you got was a gorilla holding the banana and the entire jungle. This is about dependencies. So how does this happen? Let's start with a simple abstract example. We have a small class with the three properties, like name, surname, whatever, three properties. Software evolves. The class gets large, too large. You have to think about many properties and also many methods. Then you understand that for a single responsibility principle, you have to split it. And then you break it up. But then the problem is that each helper class too often needs references to all the other parts. So person becomes something like this. You have uh, three different aspects modeled by three different classes. But each helper class too often has uh, a reference to the main class and a reference to others because these aspects depend from each other. And the dilemma is that large classes are bad because they have implicit internal dependencies. When you have a very large class, 
each method of the class has full visibility of all the others. So it's very, very easy to have full internal dependencies that are too large. But small classes introduce more references to other classes which cause more dependencies. And truly independent classes are very, very hard to design. And usually, you just, for simplicity, put those references there, and then your design goes there. Now, you see how a banana requires a gorilla that then requires a jungle. And if you want to use the software for the banana, you get your entire jungle into your process. And how is Rust different in this sense? Well, the point is that in Rust, object references, especially references to mutual objects, are very, very hard to, to, to put somewhere. They are especially hard to store inside objects, because if you want to store a reference, you need to specify its lifetime, and this is infected in the, in the code. So if you try to do it, you sort of refrain from doing that. And mutual references are exceptionally hard to use, like a person referring to an aspect of the person and the aspect referring back to the person coded in Rust is a small nightmare. And since dependencies are caused by references, the fact that the language makes the downsides of having references explicit, because if you introduce a references, you have all sort of problems up front at compile time, then this encourages independent components. So this is sort of gently or not so gently pushing you into having less stateful dependencies around. Now, let's switch topic. Let's talk about inheritance and virtual methods. Inheritance mixes implementation inheritance with interface inheritance. This is typical in object-oriented programming. Uh, it's true that sometimes, like in Java, you can have interfaces and the interfaces inherit from interfaces. But the problem is that when a class inherits from another class, it is inheriting both the interface, the specification of the method it needs to have, and the state. And this is problematic. And virtual methods, in a sense, are even worse because they mix state definition with execution control flow. Like the, the nature of an object defines the control flow that will happen. And this is not always so good. Let's make a small example. Again, we have a person. And we must model the fact that youngers and elders choose gift differently. And in typical object-oriented style, we decide to model age classes with classes. And then we model age-related behavior with virtual methods. Then we have our abstract class, which is a person with a virtual method, let's say abstract, which is choose gifts. And it gives us an array of gifts, whatever. And then we have a concrete class, which is youngster, which extends the person, where the method returns a Spotify subscription because a youngster wants to listen to music. And then we have the other concrete class, which is the elder, which instead wants a financial time subscription because he's serious and that's fine. Now, this leads to apparently near code because we can pick a person and without needing to know the age, we can say, choose the gifts and have the gifts that have been chosen. But now tell me, what must happen if somebody, while the program is running, changes age? What needs to happen inside the program is that uh, the object that we have is not good anymore. We cannot do anything with it to make it work again. We must destroy it and build another one. And this is really cumbersome. And the, the point is we wanted clean code, but what we got was code that is hard to use when requirements change in a way we did not foresee. And this is due to the fact that the virtual methods embedded the, 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 the dispatch into the state of the object, just the nature, not just values inside the object, but the actual creation of the object itself. 
How is Rust different in this sense? Well, the point is that, first of all, we need to take a step back. Who invented object-oriented programming? Well, Alan Key, the creator of Smooth Talk, said, actually, I made up the term object-oriented, and I can tell you. I did not have C++ in mind. And we can say he also didn't have in mind Java or C Sharp or all the object-oriented languages we normally use. So given this quote, what did he have in mind? Well, point is, he was ahead of his time. And he envisioned objects like cells. They were isolated, totally autonomous. There was no way to get into an object. This was totally impossible in the original object-oriented vision. And they could communicate only through message passing. Now, inheritance in Rust. Inheritance in Rust is only for pure interfaces. Traits can inherit from traits. But a type cannot inherit from other type, the implementation of the type. It can contain an instance of another type. So you can reuse definitions, but not inheriting from them, only containing them. While with traits, you have actual inheritance, but that's fine. And virtual dispatch in Rust, this kind of construct, when uh, you create a dynamic trait and maybe you box it and you assign it to something, that uh, involves dynamic dispatch. But the point is that the reference that you have is really totally opaque. It, it doesn't show up the inside of the object, because what you see is just the reference to the trait object. It does not expose the internal state. That it, it is impossible to mix a data structure definition with the virtual method definitions, because the data structure is the structure, the enum or whatever. And then you can implement the trait. But when you have got your dynamic trait, you don't see the structure anymore unless you use dynamic any whatever but it's it's cumbersome it's not encouraged by the language which means that a box a dynamic trait is really an object in the small talk sense because it's totally encapsulated now a small small rant and nitpick about the new operator Every piece of state must be created in object-oriented language invoking the appropriate constructor. And constructors are like magic functions different from other methods. And uh, this has consequences, like transmitting states to other environments requires a realization when you create another kind of data object, which is not the original class. And recreating state requires the serialization, but picking the right constructor is always tricky. And changing class to a piece of data is, well, either cumbersome or totally impossible, which means that the, the, the dynamics of the code gets very, very rigid. And we see how Rust is different. Well, there is no new operator. And any function can return a new value. And there is no compiler magic in creating new values. New values are just uh, created instantiating the literal and returning it. Dynamic traits are different because they have the V-table, but they are the special case. Normally, there is absolutely no problem with object creation. Then there is, there is this other problem that we have in mainstream object-oriented code, which is references and mutability everywhere. I'm not going to make examples because everybody knows about this. In Java style, you model state with classes, and you store mutable state in objects, and you just take mutable state for granted. You are not even thinking about immutable state. The, the tool doesn't lend to modeling immutable state properly. Objects are just places holding mutable state. And this way of thinking made so that Rick Shikley, which is the creator of the closure programming language, Define an object oriented programming actually as place oriented programming, which is sort of strange to understand. It sounds funny, but I say it was about time because why does he 
insist so much about immutability. It's because of how time mixes with the mutating values and the reasoning about values that change over time is very hard. And uh, it's hard because you have to keep in mind all the possible consequences of the mutation. So uh, Rich Hickley advocated for uh, functional programming with pure immutable values because he, he was saying, reasoning about mutation is too hard, just fix things. And the other basic assumption about mainstream object-oriented language is that everything happens on a global timeline, everything is method calls, argument passing, object creations, assignments, and time and mutability mix very, very badly. How is Rust different in this sense? Well, Rust is imperative. It is possible to have mutable state in Rust. It is allowed. But it's not a default. This is a key point. In Rust, to have something mutable, you have to add the moot keyword. But if you don't, you cannot change things. And the borrow checker steers you out of mutable state because it, it gets in the way. If something is mutable, you can do less things with it. So you are really steered away with that. And now, since we are talking about state immutable, values. Let's talk about the contrast between object-oriented programming and functional programming. The idea is that in a functional approach to programming, you model state with plain data structures. You don't need to define classes. You just define the shape of values, preferably immutable. And you write every method, not as a method, but just as a function possibly pure, taking immutable values and producing immutable values with no side effects. And this functional approach, usually dependencies are stateless. You depend on functions, not on state. And control flow becomes explicit and easy to reason about. This realization becomes trivial. And testing is a breeze because dependencies are a breeze. And comparing the principles, object-oriented and functional programming, object-oriented principles make code understandable by encapsulating moving parts. So the point is that object-oriented code has, has complexity, but it shields you from complexity by encapsulating that. Why functional programming makes code understandable by minimizing moving parts, ideally, not having them at all because everything is immutable. It's constant. You just have pure evaluations everywhere. These are two totally different approaches to handling complexity. One is encapsulation, and the other is elimination of moving parts. And this is quoted from working effectively with legacy code. When you have a lot of complexity, you have to find ways to handle this complexity. And so, I could say that a good practice is to do functional programming in the small and object-oriented programming in the large. Let's see what this means. In the small means if a computation should happen instantly, ideally instantly, it's not time-related. It's usually inside an isolated component with stateless dependencies. Then the suggestion is implement it in functional style using immutable values and pure functions. Sorry, glitch with slides. So this is something that you should do as long as it is practical. I say in the small because this usually happens in smaller components when you can really keep only stateless dependencies as pure functions. While in the large, in the large means, if there are several possibly independent tasks that interact during time, and each task has its own state, and the event order can be chaotic. So these tasks are interacting with each other, but this really happens during time, and the semantics of time is important 
for the semantics of the execution of the whole system. Then I would say, go for the actor model. Isolate each task in its own actor and make this actor exchange messages through channels. And by the way, async Rust totally shines at this. Because you can create independent actor at scale, you can have tens of thousands, hundreds of thousands of them in a process. It's not a problem at all. And you can really make them communicate using channels and have them evolve independently. So I would say that object orientation, taking inspirations from Erlang and Smalltalk, a lot of Erlang, you can say that each object is an actor with its own private state. They only interact through messages. And yes, events, messages can induce state changes inside objects or actor, but you can model these internal changes in a purely functional way. So inside an actor, you can model the actor as a pure function, which takes the state, the incoming message, and produces another state and an outgoing message. And this is probably the best of both worlds. I would say that this slide about object orientation is saying what object orientation was meant to be in theory. Now, it was meant to be, to be that in theory, but we, we can see that the mainstream languages don't encourage that kind of style. And I will do some historical considerations to explain why. Why did we get C++ instead of Smalltalk as a mainstream language? My theory, this is just my theory, in the 80s, computers were not so powerful. Proper object-oriented required totally decoupled objects, totally independent. You have to think of them as independent, isolated processes, and then you have to think about the computing power we had in the 80s. And we were just not ready to accept that. So we had an obsession with performance, and sometimes rightly so, because computers were very small, and C++ promised zero-cost abstractions, and in C++, a property access and or a virtual method call is just a single machine instruction. And performance-wise, no dynamic system could compete with that. So we just decided, let's go for performance, optimize things, use C++, and we forgot about the, the actual meaning of object orientation. Now, how Rust is different? Well, programming is the art. Now, how Rust is different as a tool? We can say that programming is the art of finding the problem program that solves a problem among the space of all possible programs. This is quite strange to think about like this, but you can really say, I've got a programming language. There are all the possible programs I could write. And when some of them are the correct ones, that solved the, the problem I had to solve. And programming, I am looking for this program among all the possible ones. Now, if we think about programming languages like this, I would say that a low-level language, in a low-level language, every program, correct or incorrect, is easy to write. The extreme, you write in assembly or machine code. It's very, very easy to write every sequence of code that is incorrect, doesn't solve the problem. You, you don't have guidelines. There is nothing steering you towards the right program. While in mainstream object-oriented programming languages, it is correct, correct programs, but badly designed, are easy to write. So the, the, the language is steering you towards correctness, but not necessarily towards a good design. While for the reason we have seen in this talk in Rust, correct and well-designed programs are easy to write. But because the way the language is, is built, if you try to write, let's say, a bad design, like with too many dependencies, too many references around, uh, or too much mutable state that you try to expose, that is very hard to write in Rust. And I would say rightly so, 
Because at that point, when you write code, you are not just going to slip a reference inside a class because it makes your life simple for the, the piece of code you are writing now. Because yes, you can do it. And that single line of code will be easier to write. But the whole maintainability of, of the, the, the program will suffer. In Rust, you try to do it. You see it doesn't compile. You, see, you think, why? And you understand the consequences of that thing. And then you find, find a design where components are truly independent because the language pushes you there. So the takeaway for the talk. I would say be critical with the programming language you use. If it has a feature, by default, don't use it and use it only when you really see that it makes your code better. And you see that it does not cause problems. And learn lots of other languages besides the one you use. It will help you to think differently. You can learn Clojure, Erlang, Go, Swift and Rust, Reason or Haskell. Clojure and Erlang in the simple functional style, Go, Swift and Rust in the imperative style, Reason and Haskell in the purely functional one. Reason is uh, OCaml with a better syntax. And then apply the lessons, lessons you learned, even if you will not change the language you are using. That's it. I've been a bit quick maybe, but the talk is done. I'm, I can take questions. All righty, cool, fantastic. So thank you very much, Masi. I'm just removing the slides. Um, also, the call to the, to the audience, if you have any questions, please ask them. I will relay them first of all. Fantastic. So um, I haven't put on my video uh, uh, in, in, in stream yet, but you could see me nodding along all the time. I, I agree with everything you said. Um, it's, it's a really good message. It really shows what's the problem uh, in thinking OP when trying to apply those learnings to other programming languages. Um, and I also 100% agree with you um, on the design part and on learning other programming languages. I myself have, have the feeling that Ever since I programmed in Rust, my JavaScript gets a lot better. <laughs> it's it's a lot nicer. So if I look at JavaScript code that I have written 10 years ago, it's like, Jesus Christ, what, what have I done? So um, this was definitely a huge effect. And I haven't written any, any C++ in 15 years, not Java in 15 years. But I think if I would go back, also my Java code would be better because you, you adapt to a different style. And also, very true, um, is that... If it's hard for you to express that program in Rust, maybe the design is wrong. So I totally agree with that. Um, if you remember my talk at EuroRust, it was exactly that. I had a design yeah. that was really, really hard to maintain. But by looking at the original problem, what I'm trying to achieve, about those individual components that were passing messages to each other, suddenly everything untangled itself. And Rust has really good structures for that, like enums, um, et cetera, to, to make a simple program also simple to write. Okay, um, I still have questions though. So sorry, that was just me rambling about and agree with you. Now I have an actual question. Um, one problem domain though, I find really, really hard to, to do well with the tools that I get from Rust up to a point where I, I'm not sure if Rust is the right programming language for that. And this is UI programming because UI programming relies a lot on you have this particular derivative of something that you can render, like a button, a text field, um, um, whatever form element that you like. And then you have the render loop, which goes through a tree of components and just calls the render function to make sure that it's being put out on screen. What you do. That's how um, um, GTK worked, how um, I forgot the one that was on, on KDE Linux. Qt worked. Um, that's basically how browsers work. So, so what would be a good approach to have this very strong object-oriented feature where you have lots of um, um, things that could be the same, but are unified with this one particular method that's being called? How would you express something like that in Rust? And with that, solve all the problems that Rust UI developers have. Yeah. <laughs> so just one actually, thing. I've been trying to follow the landscape of UI toolkits in Rust. 
I'm actually actively following it. Because even if I don't do UI programming for a living, and I never did, uh, I like the, the problem space. And I really like to understand how it works. And I occasionally do UI programming for hobbies. So I just want to be able to do it. What I noticed is that uh, UI programming is a hard problem in general. And if you think about it in the web space, which is one domain where there has been a lot of experimentation in UI paradigms, you have seen that it all started with uh, a giant mutable thing, the DOM. Mm -hmm. And you mm -hmm. write code uh, that mutates this thing piece by piece. And the community sort of decided that that was hellish and React came. And uh, then the, 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 the mainstream decision has been, yes, you have this DOM. Please try to hide it and build <laughs> a functional abstraction on top of that mm -hmm. and reason in terms of that functional abstraction. And I have seen toolkits that do this in Rust, and they work extremely well. So what I would say is that building a good UI toolkit in Rust is very hard. But once you have one, the language can really work for you. Uh, I have seen this. And you see, if, if you see even in the web landscape, like uh, you or, or the others, they, they do this kind of trick. They expose you a React-like, a reactive interface where you produce a description of what you want in an immutable way, in a functional way, and then everything works. And you trust the toolkit to be efficient. And if it is for your problem domain, it's fine. Uh, otherwise, uh, it's not for the problem domain. You should use something else. And the nice thing in, is that in the Rust ecosystem, there are a lot of uh, different toolkits for different domains. You have uh, the ones that wrap native uh, toolkits, like the ones that wrap GTK or Qt. You have the ones that abstract. You have the ones that go for the web environment and abstract the DOM. And you have the ones that are immediate, like uh, uh, IGUI. IGUI is amazing. If you want to do a quick and dirty UI, IGUI is simply it's so simple to use. And you could say it's not battery friendly. It's redrawing the whole screen all the time at the every frame. Yes, but it is GPU accelerated. You are not even going to notice that. So if you are not on a mobile environment and you really are desperate for battery life, IGUI is fantastic. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And there is Slint yeah. that mm -hmm. is also a very nice design in that space. So I say, yes, it's hard, but the hard part is coming up with a good UI toolkit. Once you have it, the language is all for you. This is my experience. Cool. Yeah, that, that, sounds, that makes a lot of sense, actually. I really need to look into it. So um, I just found out that my, my favorite uh, text editor set has now been open sourced. And I'm really curious on how they solve the UI part, because it's really snappy and really fast and really beautiful. Um, they they went for it. full GPU-based rendering. But the problem is that they use it metal and they are depending on metal, which means okay. a Linux port will be a small nightmare. Okay. Which is bad okay. for me. <laughs> okay. <laughs> Good to know. Um, maybe maybe one more question. So what I see often when I when I do uh, Rust workshops um, is I, I meet developers who have just like you spent a lot of time in all those object-oriented paradigms learned the school of, of um, um, Bob Martin and others. Um, and and one phrase that I hear all the time, not as beautiful as, as I heard it last time, was Java colored my thinking. And it's really, really hard for them to, to, to take one step back and try to approach the problem from a different angle. Um, and if, I mean, you, you, you showed why. You showed why that's a problem. But how would you approach relearning those old habits, how to get rid of this thinking and not accidentally fall back into, into the old school of OOP when approaching a new programming language like that. So what, what I did were two things. One is uh, take a hint from Clojure and Lisp about metaprogramming. So you should really think about metaprogramming at a different level. 
you should understand Lisp-like metaprogramming. Now, that works well in Clojure and Lisp dialects. Uh, Rust does have it, but in Rust it's cumbersome because uh, uh, procedural macros are, are very hard to understand. In, in Clojure, it's so natural that I really suggest you to understand that because a lot of complexity is, goes away once you have that kind of metaprogramming capability. Now, about the other part, pick a language that has uh, a good algebraic type system, OCaml, Reason, Haskell. I would stick to one of these, probably even Swift. I don't have experience in Swift, but I suspect that also Swift will do. And stick to that for a while. I mean, write code in that. In theory, even TypeScript would do. Because the type system of TypeScript yeah. is expressive enough. But the problem yeah. is that in TypeScript, it is too easy to fall back to the old habits. Because everything is still there. So I would just pick one of them. OCaml Reason, Haskell or Swift, and do an advent of coding that. Like, bang your head, and then you will really start to think differently. And once pattern matching with the union types clicks in, there's no going back. Because at that point, you see values going into the evaluation being dispatched to the branches and transformed into other values, and you really start thinking that way, and, and then you are done. But you really need to, to practice. So pick I, one of those and do an exercise, either a pet project or an adventure code. Be motivated. A pet project means motivation. The, the moment you said algebraic data types was like, ah, oh, yeah, sure. Yeah, absolutely right. Because that was also the one point for me that, that turned things, um, especially with TypeScript. Uh, so, so fantastic. Um, Masi, that's, that's amazing. Thank you so much for your insights. It was a fantastic talk. You're welcome. Uh, please propose this talk to general uh, programming conferences like Code Motion or something. I, I'm sure lots of people um, um, will get benefits from that talk uh, and lots of people need to hear it. Thank you very much. Thank you for being with us. You're welcome. People in the chat, please put another round of applause uh, in the comments uh, for Masi and for his amazing talk about object-oriented programming and how it's different in Rust. Thank you so much. Good. See you. All right. And with Masi off the stage, I'd like to welcome back Rainer. Rainer, just give me a little thumbs up if you're ready. Cool. Rainer is ready. Hey, welcome back, Rainer. You changed location. <laughs> yes, I changed location. Now I'm back in my uh, typical setup in my home office, and I'm looking forward to an interesting, I don't know, three quarter of an hour or however, however long it will take us. <laughs> <laughs> Fantastic. All right. So, Rainer, I'm going to put up your, your screen in just a second. I see it's no slides. It's just code. No slides. Just code. Okay. Slide list uh, this and, time. And please don't, please don't be angry with me if I make a lot of wrong pop culture references. We'll see. We'll <laughs> see. I, I hope crossing fingers. So, I'm looking forward <laughs> to your feedback. Cool. All righty. So, dear folks in chat, again, put out those clapping emoji. Now it's time for Rainer. Uh, Rainer, the stage is yours. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Stefan. Uh, yeah, welcome to this talk. This talk is a kind of rehearsal. I created a new talk because for the upcoming OOP conference next week, I thought I should do something different for Rust. Um, this talk, to, to make the expectation clear, this talk is not a talk for you if you have written, if you have years of Rust experience. If you know all the stuff like ownership and borrowing and RCs and ref cells and all these things, I will probably not be able to tell you something. However, if you have time and if you enjoy listening to me, stay here and give me feedback. I would really love to hear your feedback. If you are a C, C++ developer, for instance, if you come from a managed language like JavaScript, Java, C Sharp, whatever, you took a little bit of a look into Rust, but you are not sure uh, what this Rust thing is all about, then this talk is exactly for you. You will see assembler code. You will hear a lot of pop culture references. We will see uh, where everything brings us. Let's get started. Ah, by the way, you will not see any slides. We will just see code, okay? I will type a little bit of code. I will copy a little bit of code. 
we will see. Uh, you do not need to take notes. If you like anything, if you'd like to play with something that I'm going to show in the upcoming 45 minutes or so, um, you can obviously grab the code from GitHub. I think Stefan will share the link with you in the chat. And with that, without any further ado, let's get started. Let's, let's start with something very, very simple. Memory management, let's start with a primitive data type with something like a number, right? Let's say we have a number, something like this. Let's make this guy mutable and maybe change it a little bit. Let's say x plus equals 1. And at the end, we want to print this thing. And I created a small little method, print bytes. Yes, it is. And I will give it this pointer here. Now, this example is not very exciting. Obviously, it will print something like 43 on the screen, but I, I want to get started very slowly and take a look what this really means. Well, we have here a primitive data type. It's an I32. That's an integer with 32 bits, obviously. We change this integer, and in Rust, as you might know, variables are by default immutable, so we have to make this thing mutable in order to be able to change it, and then we are going to print this thing. Well, this should be possible to build. Let's see. Yeah, we can build it. But I would like to show you another tool which I'm going to use throughout this session. And this tool is called, let me bring up my just file. It's called Cargo Asm. Cargo Asm is an extension to Cargo. Cargo, you can install it. Just use your favorite search engine. You're pretty sure you are going to be able to find it. And what we now can do is we can say just Asm Playground. And then we are going to see our beautiful method here in assembler code. And this is what I want to do in the first part of this session. I would like to write a little bit of code and then take a look what's going on behind the scenes. Where does this X live on? Does it live on the heap? Does it live on the stack? What happens if we copy it? What happens when we transfer ownership? I really want to go down to the metal and take a look at it. Now, if you are not that familiar with assembler, what we are going to see here, for instance, here you see it, we see that on the one hand side, and that's an interesting one, it's not so much related to memory management. However, maybe it's interesting for you. As you can see, the compiler did some optimizations. There is no 42 anymore. So the answer to everything has been lost because the, com the compiler already recognized that 42 plus one is 43. And this is what you see here. And this RSP sounds like stack pointer. So what we can immediately see, our variable, no surprise here, lives on the stack. And then when we call this bytes thing, we are doing this LIA operation. And this essentially loads the address of the variable on the stack into a register called RDI. And this is what's going to happen. We are going to pass the variable by reference through this register RDI, which is a pointer to our variable on the stack. So this is the, a very simple example to get started, a variable on the stack, and we are passing a reference to a method print bytes, as we can see here, through a register. OK, good. Now we are warm. Now we warmed up. We can go one step further. Let's change this a little bit. And this time, we are going to create numbers. And here, I hope that my good friend, uh, yeah, GitHub Copilot, will help me a little bit. But here, I would like to print maybe some numbers, maybe an x68, uh, and then a 69. That would be, I think, high or something like this. And then let's go into the next line. That would be a line feed character. And then let's terminate the string just to have a little bit of fun. OK, and then we are going to print these numbers. Well, if you come from a language like C Sharp, for instance, you know that arrays are classes and therefore they live on the heap. So you could imagine that an array like that in Rust also lives on the heap. That is not the case. Let me tell you that that is not the case. And we are going to take, obviously, we take a look at the assembler code to really find out what's going to happen. What we see here is that here we are allocating a bunch of bytes on the heap sub RSP 24 means we are shifting down the stack pointer by 24 bytes. And then these two things are essentially to make a long story short, they are copying bytes, which are part of our compilation unit. This, these numbers have been compiled into the executable. And again, we are copying them onto the stack. 
Now, how, how does this work? Essentially, we are using a 128-bit um, register here on my computer. So uh, luckily, these numbers, they fit into this large register, and it can simply load this memory into this register, and then load the content of this register into the stack, and then again, we can call the print bytes. So this is a very important takeaway here, that arrays in Rust, they live on the stack. However, there is this other guy in Rust, which would be a vector. A vector is really an array of dynamic size. It can grow, it can shrink, but still it has a kind of array nature. This guy, the vector, does not live on the stack. It lives on the heap. I'm sparing you the assembler code here. Just trust me, this is true. The vector lives on the heap, but the, stack, the array lives on the stack. Okay. We're good. So we learned something in terms of memory management. Arrays live on the stack if you don't do something special. And we are going to take a look at specialities in a second. Now, next step, breathe in, breathe out. Let's introduce more interesting data types. So far, we have taken a look at numeric data types. Now, I want to add a kind of um, a, a structure. Okay, I will add three structures which I prepared. I don't want you to watch me typing, but of course, I'm going to show you what these structures are all about. You see, we have a structure which is called point. It has X and Y. We have a point 3D, which has X, Y, and Z. And finally, we have a structure point copy. But please keep in mind, this guy here, this guy implements the traits copy and clone. If you are new to Rust, you maybe don't know what copy and clone is but you will know in a few minutes, okay? So remember point, point 3D and point copy. Good. With that, we can go into the next example. I created, again, a little bit of a setup here, only a few lines of code, nothing complicated. Here you can see I'm generating a point 3D. This is what I want to do here. Uh, the numbers are 15, 16, uh, 15, 14, and 13. And then I'm going to change it. I'm going to add one, two, and three. So everything is on 16. So hexadecimal one zero. This is what we have. Let's take a look where this point lives. Again, if you come from managed languages, like for instance, C-sharp, you might say, okay, structs are something like classes in C-sharp. So I guess point 3D will be allocated on the heap, right? Well, no, you're wrong. In this case, the struct is allocated and lives on the stack. Let me show you that by, you guessed right, let's take a look at the assembler code, right? I knew you wanted to see the assembler code. Let's take a look. Now, the, the compiler was very, very smart again, because what we see here, again, we have a stack allocation. We allocate 24 bytes by shifting down the stack pointer by 24. And then the system is using this magic number. Do you know what this magic number is? I can tell you because I looked it up. I couldn't do it in my mind, and maybe some of you also can't do it in your mind. This is exactly what this number is all about. And this 16 here is obviously also 0x110. So if you take a look, this is hexadecimal 10. This is hexadecimal 10 after the change. And this is hexadecimal 10. And this is exactly what's going on here. We are moving this large number, which is exactly two of these coordinates of the point 3D. We are moving it into a register called REX, and then we are moving this guy onto the stack. And then finally, we are also moving the last 0x10 onto another part of the stack. And then we're using the RDI register again to pass a reference onto the stack to the method print bytes. This is what's going on. So this was the proof. If you create a structure like that in Rust, you are effectively allocating memory on the stack. It lives on the stack. This is what's going on here. Now, those of you who say, hmm, what if I don't want that? In languages like C Sharp, again, you have the choice. You can use a class, heap. You can use a stack, sorry, you can use a struct, stack, class, heap, struct, stack. How can I do that in Rust? Well, you can absolutely do that in Rust. Absolutely no problem. But what you have to do then is you have to box new this thing. If you create a box new, something new will happen. Well, let's switch it a little bit. 
So maybe let's do it like that. So we only have two um, thingies here. And I think with that, we are good to go. And let's take a look what's going to happen now. Now that we have a box. Now, take a look at the assembler code. And this time, the assembler code is a little bit longer. But don't worry, it will not be too complicated. The important things are essentially this one here. See it? Rust Enoch. And if we scroll down, Rust D and this is what's going to happen. And I think with that, I, I, I probably have already spoiled the, the, um, the, the surprise here because Rust alloc sounds an awful lot like allocating something on the heap. And that is exactly what's going on here. It's allocating memory on the heap. Here it's just, just checking if the value that was returned is not zero. That is the test RAX RAX. And at the end of the day, we are copying some magic numbers. You, you can guess it right. This magic number is, again, the content of x and y after the change here. It's moved again, but this time not onto the stack, but we are moving it into the um, address, which is contained in rex. And that is exactly what we got back from the Rust alloc. So here we are moving our magic number onto the heap. And then, again, we are passing a reference to this one through our uh, RDI. And that's exactly what's, what's, what's going on here, OK? So this guy is living on the heap. This is what I want to, wanted you to see. And finally, what we also see, the box new is here, but we didn't free anything. Yeah? C programmer in the room? Somebody? If you are a C programmer, you probably wonder, why is there a dialog happening? Well, that's. The reason why that's the reason why Rust is so so uh, widely used and so, um, so so anticipated by by C developers, for instance, because for Rust does the deallocation for you without having a garbage collector and without having smart pointers, and this happens because of the ownership principle, which we are going to talk in a few more minutes. So for now, just trust me. That's Harry Potter programming, a little bit of fairy dust, and at the end of the method, the heap memory goes away magically. And how this happens, you will hear more about it in a second. So we have learned something. Rust alloc, it gets precise, it allocates memory on the heap, and we copy the memory, the content into it, and then we can pass um, a reference. Perfect. Awesome. I think with that, we can take a look at the next example. But for the next example, we need a little bit of background knowledge. So far, I wanted to point out what lives on the stack and what lives on the heap. But as you see now, when it comes to heap allocation, cleaning up is really an important point. And we cannot go on in this talk without, at this point in the talk, talking about the super important fundamental concept of Rust, and that is ownership and borrowing. And this will be a new stage here in this talk. So breathe in, breathe out. We'll quickly change the scenery, and we will get back to assembly in a second. But first, we will make it very clear what this ownership and borrowing is all about. And then I'm going to show you how this ownership thing cares for this fairy dust that deallocates the memory on the heap. OK, good. Let's do that. I prepared a little bit here, a new module. And in this module, we are going to create a little bit of a data structure. And here I am using a little bit of a, of a um, let's say, uh, of a, of a uh, reference to a book, which I very much liked. And it's Lord of the Rings. Probably many of you know the book. And inside the book, there is this precious ring. And so I created a structure, which is called My Precious Ring. And it has an engraving on it. And it says, one ring to rule them all. As you can see here, if the ring is forged, when the ring is forged, the engraving says, one ring to rule them all. So good. With that, we would like to have a little bit of fun by creating this method here, ownership ring. And here, we are going to copy in some statements. And I'm going to demonstrate to you what ownership and borrowing means when it comes to Rust. First, let's create the ring. OK, let's create the ring. Here it is. As you can see here, we are, I don't need that one, we are forging the ring. And who forged the ring? Sauron. And then, yeah, Sauron's ring says, and probably we are going to read one ring to rule them all. That's perfectly fine. 
Now, as you all know, Sauron lost the ring and somebody else found the ring. So here we have Gollum finding the ring. And the important line here is this one. This is where Gollum finds the ring, and this is where Rust transfers the ownership. So now we have a transfer of ownership going on. What does transfer of ownership mean? Transfer of ownership means that Sauron can no longer access his ring. If Sauron tries to take a look at the ring, Rust at compile time would immediately say, I'm very sorry, Sauron, you get, we, we had a transfer of ownership. This is no longer your ring. We are very sorry. Please go away. If I do that here, everything works. If I do that here, nothing works because the ownership was transferred. And why is that so important when it comes to memory management? Because ownership does not mean that Gollum has a certain permission on the ring. No, it just means that Gollum is now responsible for, listen closely, freeing the memory. That's what ownership is all about. The owner, when the owner goes out of the scope, the memory is freed. And this is why in the previous example, our, uh, boxed, uh, our, our boxed object was deallocated automatically because the owner in the previous example, I think it was the, the, the point, the point got out of scope. And here we do not go out of scope, but we transfer the ownership explicitly. This is what's going to happen here. Now you all know how the story continues, right? Of course you know, because Gollum lost the ring to Bilbo. Oh, sorry, I forgot one line here. I forgot to copy one line. Here it is. Frodo will enter the stage in a second. Here, Gollum's ring is transferred to Bilbo's ring. And that means that, again, we have a transfer of ownership. We have the same principle again if Gollum tries to take a look at his precious, it doesn't work yeah? because the transfer of ownership happened. Now is the time for Frodo to enter the stage. Frodo takes the ring from Bilbo, you all know that from the story, and then something very interesting happens because Frodo is joined by his very friend Samwise. And Samwise sometimes needs to borrow the ring. Maybe you have read the book or seen the, the film. At one point in the film and the book, uh, Samwise takes the ring to keep this ring safe. And you see, this now works. Why? Because in this case, we do not have a transfer of ownership. But here, Samwise is only doing a read-only borrow. That's the technical term. A read-only borrow of the ring. So here, it, Samwise is not taking ownership of the ring. But still, Samwise can access the ring in a read-only manner. He cannot change the ring. Frodo didn't lose didn't lose control over the ring. Frodo still had, have the, has the ring and he still can access the ring and try to destroy it, for instance. Oh, I have a typo here. That shouldn't happen. So this is good. So you see, this works perfectly fine. Absolutely okay. So this is a borrow. And this is, this is what indicates a read-only borrow here. Now, the next one, uh, I need a small little helper function here. I will copy it in. And this helper function is called heat. And here you see the third thing that you need to understand when it comes to memory management and ownership and borrowing, and that's the mutable borrow. The mutable borrow allows the receiver to change the object. And in this case, if you heat up the ring from Lord of the Ring, the engraving will be, will be seen and you see an, an engraving that I can't pronounce. I'm very sorry, I cannot speak this language. You have to read it on your own. If you are capable of reading it correctly, you, uh, I, I, you have my, uh, my respect, absolutely. But here we just say, okay, if we heat it, it the engraving some changes a little bit. Let, let's say this works. So let's try this with our ring and make Frodo's ring mutable. In this case, we simply do a shadowing. So we take the old Frodo's ring and now we shadow it with a new variable and make this variable from here on mutable. And if we have that, it's pretty simple to mutate the ring. Understand that Frodo still has ownership over the ring. 
because here we didn't write simply Frodo's ring. That would be a transfer of ownership. In this case, we simply borrowed a mutable reference to heat, to the heat function, and so it could change the object. But Frodo is still the ring owner. Now, can we do that with, Sam, with Samwise too? Let's try something. Let me show you something. I copy something in here, and this time we are giving, you can maybe guess it, we are giving Frodo, um, Frodo, we are taking a mutable borrow for Frodo's ring, and we are creating a second mutable borrow at the same time for Samwise's ring. Now, if we heat up Frodo's ring, everything is no longer fine. Why? Because this is not allowed. There is only one owner, obviously. I mean, it's Lord of the Ring, right? If you don't like Lord of the Ring, take, I don't know, Highlander, this movie from the 80s. Uh, there can only be one or something like that. There is only one ownership, one owner. We have as many read-only borrows as you want, okay? Many people can borrow for a short amount of time or at the same time the ring. Well, here we have a problem with the story, but how, because how can one ring be borrowed by multiple people at the same time? Well, in the digital world, it's absolutely possible. And with the mutable borrows, the rule is there can only be one mutable borrow at the same time. We have one owner and we can have one mutable borrow. So we have two things here, but not more. And in this case, we would have more, so it doesn't work. So this is um, the, a typical uh, restriction that we have here. And that is also super, super important because only then Rust is capable of doing memory management correctly. Last but not least, I have prepared here the last method here. It says destroy, and this ASCII art picture here should symbolize that we take the ring and throw it into the fiery, uh, into fiery mountain or whatever. So if we take here uh, Frodo's ring and destroy it, uh, GitHub Copilot already spoils it, then the ownership transfer is happening. And we are taking Frodo's ring, we are giving it to the destroy function, and this destroy function is taking ownership, and then it does nothing with the ring, so the ring, poof, disappears. It's no longer there. And if Frodo tries to access his ring after the destroy method, it doesn't work anymore because it no longer has ownership. The ring is gone. And believe it or not, Rust has a function, the experienced Rust developers in the room know that, that does exactly that. It's something which is very interesting. So there is a function which is called drop. Here you see drop. And if you take a look at this uh, implementation of the standard library drop function, it does exactly nothing. It simply takes ownership and swallows the type. It simply does nothing. And by not doing anything with it, there is no longer an owner. The owner, in this case, underscore X, goes out of scope. Memory is deallocated. And this is exactly what happened in the example before. So now you should have a better understanding what transfer of ownership means, only one owner, what read-only borrows are, as many read-only borrows as you want, what a mutable borrow is. Owner stays the owner, but the recipient of the mutable borrow can change the object. Now, if we go, get, go back to main, we can now apply this newly acquired knowledge here in our playground method. We allocated some memory here. So the owner of the box point is this one. And when does point go out of scope? Exactly here. The owner point goes out of scope and therefore the memory is automatically deallocated. This is what's happening here. Now, let's take a closer look at this example. What's going to happen if we transfer the ownership? Let's do something like this, okay? So let's transfer the ownership here in line 38, and let's compare what's going to happen. So I will um, as disassemble that one. Well, make it, let, let's make it a little bit more simple so that we can see it more easily. So I'm not going to allocate memory on the heap here. I'm going to allocate the memory on the stack. Here you see the code, and now I'm removing the transfer of ownership again. I'm decompiling everything again, and now you can compare this with 
this one here. And do you see any differences? Well, no. And that's a very important other concept that I would like to remember here, um, that I would like you to remember. If you do a transfer of ownership, that is really just a, a concept for the developers. That's an abstraction. That's a rule that is enforced by the compiler. But at the end of the day, it's a zero cost abstraction. It's a rule that is not enforced at, at runtime, but this is a rule that is really enforced at compile time. So it's a concept of the compiler. And you will not see this thing directly in the assembler code, as you have seen before. Nice. Let's take a sip of water. Let's breathe in, breathe out, next act. Now I'm going to make all the fans of Lord of the Rings very, very, very angry because now I am going to create, to recreate this whole universe of Lord of the Ring in a very different way because I'm going to introduce a module. See here, this is my module. And this module also has a precious ring. It's also forged, but the module is called, hey, we are all friends here. What does that mean? Well, for those of you who watched closely what I did, who you probably have already seen this copy and clone here on top of the my precious ring, right? Now, this changes essentially everything. We could, I think we can safely say that. And this is what I would like to show you next. What does it mean if a type implements copy and or clone? Let's take a look at this. Um, here, happy, let's rename this one. This is now happy Lord of the Rings. It's not a, a tragical Lord of the Rings, but now you will see everything will be super happy and, and nobody will be angry at somebody. It, it's kind of boring Lord of the Rings, but let's see. First, we need to forge the ring. We will obviously do that by calling forge on the new version of the my precious ring and with that our friend sauron can obviously read the ring and he has his ring and maybe he wouldn't have turned into a kind of a unfriendly person if he would have kept the ring i don't know but in, in this happy world he will keep the ring although the code will look very similar to what we have seen before do you see this line here See that one? Before I told you this is a transfer of ownership, but you know what? This is no longer a transfer of ownership because let me show you, Sauron is happy. He is having a really good time because he still has a ring. As our ring now implements the copy trait, this has a new semantics here. This now means in Rust, let's copy the data bitwise. This is what's going to happen here, okay? If we don't want this implicit copy, we can ignore copy, then we are going to have a problem here again. See, doesn't work anymore, but we can make an explicit copy by calling clone. And that's the big difference between copy and clone. If your data type can be copied by doing a bitwise copy, you can simply derive the copy trait. If you're, you, you need a very specific business logic, you could implement a clone logic on your own. Uh, say, think of cloning uh, a file handle where you have to reopen a file or something like this. Then you would probably implement the clone trait. Okay, good. Let's go back to the copy and clone. I think so far you've got the idea what I am trying to say. And of course, we can go on. You see, now we have two rings. Everybody's happy. Maybe Gollum would have more hair on his head if everything is, is OK. But now you see Bilbo gets a copy of the ring and Frodo gets a copy of the ring. And everybody is happy. Everything is awesome. And the Lord of the Ring has been rewritten by just adding a copy trait. Why didn't they just add the copy trait to this, to this ring? I don't uh, you, you know the idea. OK, so you learned something. You learned about the copy trait here. Now let's go back to our small little assembler exercise here. And let's change our playground. Uh, maybe you can remember that I created before the structure point copy, right? And now I want to experiment with exactly that structure. Let me show you what we are going to do. First, we are going to create this point copy. 
That's the first thing. Then we are making a copy of our point by doing a simple assignment. Because point copy implements the copy trait, here no transfer of ownership is going on. We are really copying the point. And last but not least, because we made a copy, we can access both variables, point and point two. Now let's take a look at the resulting assembler code, which we get here by running this, um, this, this cargo ASM again. Um, and it, what, what you see here is again, our magic number. This magic number is, uh, I, I, I looked it up. It's, it's um, hex E and hex F, and that's exactly 14. See here point that's, um, no, the first one, not the, sorry, 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 sorry. Um, the first, yeah, of course, sorry, I was, I was off track, track for a second. Now again, 14 plus one is 15, which is hex F. 12 plus two is 14, which is hex E. So this magic number is here, a long hexadecimal number, which if you decode is, is E and then a lot of zeros and then F. So this is essentially our point. And now we see that the compiler here has a second magic number, and that's essentially the result of this plus this plus this and this plus this plus this. So you never see in the assembler code, you never see an increment statement or the addition or something like this. In this assembler code, you also do not see a mem copy or something like this. So if somebody tells you that something like this with the copy trait is always a bitwise copy of the original memory, that's simply wrong. That's also something that you can take a look, can take away from this talk. It, it's, many of the rules that we learn in Rust, like, okay, we do a bitwise copy, they are true concept on a conceptual level. But if you really take a look what the compiler does, there is so much optimization going on that sometimes these rules are on the metal, they are no longer true. Because here, the compiler calculated everything and he simply came up with the entire pre-compiled memory and simply loads it on the stack and that's it. So no memory copy from here to here is really going on. The compiler is creating something different. But conceptually, we are creating a copy. And this is what I wanted to show you. So this worked out very, very nicely. Good. We have copy, the copy trait. Now we have ownership. We have borrows. We have mutable borrows. We understand stack. We understand heap. But I guess that many of the developers here in the room who have not done a lot of Rust development now ask themselves, if the rules are so strict, I mean, how should I implement non-trivial data structures? How should I implement a double linked list? How should I implement a graph data structure? How should I implement, you name it. In real life, sometimes there are more owners, right? It, it just happens in complex data structures, in dynamic data structures, you have multiple owners of some memory. So how can this be done? And how can this be solved with the ownership rules? This is exactly what the next part in this talk will be all about. I will take a sip of water and you can, as always, breathe in, breathe out and prepare yourself for the next act. Good. I switch over to the next module, which I have prepared here. And inside of this module, I'm going to add a bunch of use statements. Uh, let me get that one here. And I think I accidentally deleted the heat method, which I'm going to need. I'm super sorry. So I'll put it here. This is the heat method that you learned before. You've seen it before, but this time we are going to again rewrite Lord of the Rings. This time, Sauron is obviously forging the ring. Okay, and then a lot of stuff happens. You know, Sauron, ah, this clumsy guy is again losing the ring. Maybe he it, it, it fell from his hand or because it's so bony or I don't know, but somebody picked it up somebody gave it away and at the end of the day it reached uh frodo but frodo this time does something which is pretty smart he takes the ring and puts it into an rc now what is an rc an rc is a ref counter 
In Rust and RC is a ref counter. It means that we want to change the, the rules of the game a little bit. We all know that there can be only one owner. However, if you put your memory into an RC, you have a ref counter and essentially a lot of people can have a ref counter and this ref counter internally can reference the same object. So somehow we end up with one memory location, but all the different ref counters, they all point to this one location. You might ask yourself, how is that done? Why is the ref, the, the ref counter, why doesn't it have to, uh, to, to abide to the to rules of ownership? Well, it's simple. There is a concept in Rust which is called unsafe programming. And in unsafe programming, you are in the wild, wild west. You can do whatever you want. You have pointers. You can do crazy stuff. And this is how the magic happens behind the scenes. A lot of stuff in the core and standard library is written in unsafe code. Luckily, this code is very well tested, but it is like it is. They are special. You could be special too if you write unsafe code. I'm not sure if you want that. If you want, try it. I'm feeling more for safe Rust, but if you want to try it, you can. Conceptually, however, we now have a ref counter, and we will see in a second that we can make a clone of this ref counter, and another clone of this ref counter, and another clone of this ref counter, and then we have the memory, and all these ref counters, they point internally to the same memory location. The ownership principle, it applies to the ref counter. So if the ref counter goes out of scope, this ref counter is destroyed and it will, re it will decrement the internal reference count. So at this point, we have a reference count of four, then three, then two, then one. And if we reach a ref count of zero, Rust will automatically deallocate the memory. This is what ref counters are all about. So what can we do with this thing? Well, first we can, if we want, take a look at the ref counter. We can use a method which is called strong count. And this method strong count will give us the, the, the number of ref counters uh, or the number of references to our ring. This will, at this point in the application, just trust me, I can write later on if you want, but this will be one because only Frodo currently has the ring. And he can access the ring. It's also important to understand that in this case, the, uh, the, uh, the Frodo's ring, although it's, it's a ref counter, it's somewhat, um, let's say, somewhat uh, transparent. Let's, let's use this word, okay? So I can directly access the engraving uh, field here, um, although it's inside the, the ref counter. I'll not go into details how this is done. You can build your own data types that have this capability to be some kind of transparent. So you can directly access the methods of the underlying object. But this is a story of a, a, a new talk with a lot of other pop culture references. But for today, just trust me, ref counter is capable of doing exactly that. Now, if we think of Samwise, what we can do here is we can simply clone Frodo's ring, and that's allowed. But keep in mind, we are not cloning the ring here. We are cloning the ref counter. We are getting a new ref counter. What does that mean? We get a teeny tiny little object on our stack, which is the ref counter. Uh, no, not the ref counter. It's just a reference to a memory location where the ref counter lives. And essentially, this new variable on the stack will increase the ref counter by one. So now we have a ref counter for Frodo's ring of two. If this RC object goes out of scope here at the end of the method, it will decrement the ref count. And if this one, Frodo's ring, goes out of scope, it will again decrement the ref count. And there, the ref count will reach zero, and therefore, the memory will be deallocated. Perfect. And we can take a look if this is really true. So never trust what I'm saying. Always try it on your own. Here, I'm printing out the number of owners, and I'm also printing out the, the, the pointers um, of, of all these ref count objects. And now we are going to take this guy here, go into the main method and comment out the playground and call um, share the ring. This is the method that we just wrote. And with that, we run this thing. And it should now say, first, we have one owner. And finally, we have two owners. And behind the scenes, both RCs point to the same memory. And that's exactly the kind of memory management that I wanted you to see.
So this is what other languages maybe sometimes refer to as, um, as, as smart pointers or something like this. But in, in Rust, this is called a ref counter. Perfect. Now, this is, this is really perfect. So let's heat up the ring, right? Let's make this ring um, mutable. Very simple. Let's say let mute Frodo's ring. Frodo's, where is it? Um, didn't I call it Frodo's ring? Yes, I did call it Frodo's ring, but I want to, to copy this one. So I do not do a typo. And let's do something like this. And then let's call a heat and simply give it the mute of Frodo's ring. Everything should be fine. It's not fine. The next problem. What is the problem here? Well, we can't borrow an RC mutable. Do you remember what mutable borrow means? Can I remember it from the last example? Mutable borrow means that we are still the owner, but we give a mutable borrow to somebody else so that somebody else can write into the data structure. And this is exactly what the heat method does. It changes the engraving, but it's not allowed. Why? Well, the reason is simple. If we have a single object and we have a lot of ref counters that reference all this object. If a lot of people suddenly take a, a, a mutable borrow on this, on this memory location, we can easily run into a race condition because then many people, all these owners of the ref counters could write to this memory location. And that would be, yeah, you, you probably know it, that that would end up in, 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 in a lot of problems in, in race conditions. We, we are not allowed to do that. We cannot do that. We need some kind of, of semaphore, some mutex or whatever. We need some kind of mechanism that at runtime makes sure that only one, only one location in our program can at one point in time write to the memory. Giving out read-only borrows is absolutely no problem. And this is exactly what we are going to do here. But we cannot allow, if we have ref counting, we cannot allow to give out um, mutable borrows. We are very sorry. So this does not work. Oh my God, what should we do? Yes, we have, we have a, a solution for that. And that will be the last part of my talk. So I will take a final sip of water and you, what do you do? Breathe in, breathe out and make yourself ready for the last and final act. Let's add another method. This time we are calling this method here, share and alter, okay? As always, Sauron is forging the ring. Next, this ring somehow gets to Frodo. Okay, good, let's do it like that. This time Frodo will again create a ref counter because somehow for Frodo, it really worked out because by having a ref counter, he can more easily share the ring with his friends, like for instance, Samwise. So Frodo learned something. This looks pretty amazing. So what else does Frodo do? He puts the ring into another additional layer. It's something like an onion. You know, what we are going to do here is we are taking a so-called ref cell and mewing up this ref cell. Now, what is a ref cell? A ref cell is a reference to, to some memory, but ref cell has a very unique capability. It can, it can check the ownership and borrowing rules at runtime, not at compile time. So it's essentially the ownership and borrowing checker built into the compiler, but conceptually not running at compile time, but at runtime. And that is exactly what we need. If we have a more complicated data structure where we have a piece of memory where many people are kind of owner by having a ref count object for this memory, we need to synchronize their access. And this is exactly what ref cell does. If more than one location in our program asks for a mutable borrow at the same time, it will say no, but it will not check that at compile time because the compiler cannot know when somebody in our program will ask for a mutable borrow. So this is not done at compiler, but at runtime. And this is exactly what the ref, uh, ref cell is. And by combining it with the ref counter, we have something very, very powerful, a pattern which is called uh, internal mutability pattern. Um, we, we are having something that can have multiple owners with ref counting and still the capability to be borrowed in a mutable way. Let me show you how this works. If we want to have a read-only reference, we simply say borrow. And we can have as many read-only borrows as we want. We already learned that, but this borrow here will check that at runtime. 
Now, if Samwise comes and borrow and, 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 and clones our ring, we are again cloning the RC. We are cloning the RC and we are referencing to the same ref cell. And absolutely no problem. We can check how many owners we have. And of course, Frodo has no problem still accessing the ring. He is still owner, or in this case, he can still do a read-only borrow. That's not a problem. But now we can do something amazing. We can call the heat method by doing a borrow mute. And that is exactly what we want, right? Now we get a mutable borrow and the ref cell will check at the runtime if there is only one mutable borrower at this time. This is the case, so we are very good. Once this mutable borrow goes out of scope, and in this case, I'm not even storing it in a variable, so it disappears immediately, we can, without any problems, get the next mutable borrow, or in this case, the next read-only borrow. And what would happen? If we create multiple mutable borrows at the same time, let's say let mute Frodo's Frodo's ring mutable, and let's make this one a um, mutable borrow. And then I'm going to copy this one and say this is now Samwise Samwise uh, ring mute something like this. Oh, did I tell you something wrong? I told you that it's not possible to have two mutable borrows at the same time. Well, Rust is very, very smart. It sees that you have this mutable borrow, but you are not using it. So you just ask for it, but you don't use it. So that is not a problem. That is really not a problem. But if we now, for instance, here, call this heat method again and give it the uh, Frodo's, whoops, sorry, the Frodo's ring, um, mutable, I think this is how I called it, right? This will, no, this will no longer work because I need something like this. And then I think I can show you that I can demonstrate you the, uh, the, the, the thing here. And let's take Samwise ring mute. And now everything should crash. I am, let me quickly copy this in. I did something, yes. I did something wrong. I did exactly that one wrong. I'm very sorry. Of course, Samwise, Samwise has to copy this one and then the, I did something wrong. Let me copy in the entire code. I shouldn't write code when I'm talking. I'm not good at talking and writing at the same time. Then why does this work? This should work. Should it? Hmm. Okay. So good that this is a rehearsal. I have to think about this one. Mm. I have to think about this one. Of course, this doesn't work. Okay, I have to think about this one. The last demo didn't work. I'm super sorry for that. Um, I don't have the brain power here on stage to think this through. I tried it, but I in my, my example, I did obviously something wrong. I'm super sorry. I will think about this one uh, later on. However, forget this last demo. I will, I will try that. Everything else went pretty smoothly. And I would like to summarize my talk in the last few moments here of this talk. My goal was to show you and give you a little bit of insight what's going on in Rust. Okay, I want to end in memory management. We started by taking a look at the differences between heap and, and stack allocation, and I showed you some assembler code, so you get an idea what's really going on behind the scenes. You saw that because of optimizations, sometimes things aren't as they seem to be. Now, sometimes the optimizer creates code which does something that you haven't wrote, written down, but essentially because of optimization, it works that one up. And I try to give you a more detailed insight into uh, how ownership and borrowing and read-only borrowing exists and why we need ref counting, why we need ref counting with ref cells. Unfortunately, I only had uh, 55 or 50 minutes or something like this, so I cannot go into the whole uh, multi-threaded world like ARC atomic ref count or uh, RW lock, like reader write a lock that we can use, for instance, to write multi-threaded web servers and things like that. So at the end of the day, this is something for the next talk. Thank you for listening.
thank you for staying until the end. I hope you had a little bit of fun and you learned at least a little tiny, teeny little bit. And with that, back to Stefan. Let's talk about what he thinks about the talk. All righty. Thank you, Rainer. Thank you so much for your talk. That was uh, a, a whirlwind tour through basically everything memory management, including memory. <laughs> <laughs> that's, that's, that's fantastic. Um, I want to say a huge thank you to everybody in the chat because we had so much fun with all the Lord of the Ring references. Oh, really? Uh, and, and it became a meme at one point. And, and I just couldn't. I just couldn't stop laughing. So uh, thank you, uh, everybody who has who has contributed to that. Somebody suggested to rewrite Lord of the Rings in Rust because we rewrite all, everything in Rust. Absolutely. And he said, uh, or they said, um, maybe ask ChatGPT for that. I did that. It works out really, really well. So. <laughs> <laughs> to, to be honest, I have to tell you a story, uh, Stefan. What I did in the afternoon, I, I wrote all these examples and then I checked all the references with ChatGPT. Is it true <laughs> that this and is it true that that? Um, what I didn't, uh, what I didn't uh, show here um, is I, I didn't show the um, the last chapter and uh, that is the lifetime chapter. Uh, we can quickly have a chat, but there in my original concept, I have some demos for lifetimes, but this is a takeaway that I take away from this trial here. I have to think about what I'm going to, to leave out because I really want to talk a little bit about lifetimes. Lifetimes would have been interesting because in lifetime, we have Gandalf fighting the Balrog. So that would already have been very Spoilers. interesting. Spoilers. <laughs> For everybody who hasn't seen Lord yeah. of the Rings. Yet. Okay, so, so if you take a look at my sample on GitHub, you will see some examples for mm. lifetimes. Um, but yeah, I simply dropped it now because otherwise I would have been talking for another half. Yeah, it's, it's, it's a lot of content, isn't it? So I, yeah. I think giving it a dry run in front of an audience gives you a really good feeling mm. on what to include mm. and what to leave out. Mm. Yeah. And, mm. you, and the thing is, you know, with the top leg that mm. you can spend hours basically. Mm. Hmm? doing everything. Uh, we had one question from uh, from one of our, our audience members um, who asked, what does inline never do? Ah, it's, very good question. Uh, uh, and by the way, now I fully understand what I made wrong in my demo. I'm super sorry. Uh, I, I, I told, I, I'm, so, I'm, I'm so stupid. This is something that happened when you are on stage. The last demo, I told you that it checks at runtime. It can that's what, that's what Masi time. put in the chat as well. Oh, really? Oh, thank yeah, you yeah. very much. Now, now, <laughs> ah, now it's perfectly clear for me. I'm super sorry for that. I, I had a little, <laughs> I was off the track. So now to your question. What mm -hmm. does... Um, yeah, does inline never do? I put the question up again. What does inline never do? Yeah, uh, you see, if I don't do inline never for this method, the compiler will essentially add the implementation of the method directly in line into the method where I would like to show you the assembler code. And then the assembler code is very, very long because I'm calling the print line macro in there and there is a lot of stuff going on. And therefore, I simply wrote the helper method where I say inline never, so the assembler code is clean. Mm -hmm. That's the only reason why I did it. I wanted to show you assembler code and that is how I achieved to keep it rather small. It's actually pretty amazing if you think about that um, LLVM can if it sees the right piece of code, it can already evaluate it and put the result in. So this is one of the amazing optimizations of LLVM. Yeah. I'm, I'm yeah. very um, impressed by that. Mm -hmm. um, other than that, we got lots of feedback on your on your talk. Uh, people who, you know, classic Reiner, pure <laughs> live coding, good old fashioned. So people love that. That's amazing. Love it. Love um, it. But one uh, question was also really good. So it would be interesting to compare. They said SIG and Rust memory management of Enamel Race, there's a wonderful article on that. I will put two links into the chat if that's okay mm -hmm. for you, because there are two Absolutely. amazing videos. One about visualizing memory layout of Rust data mm -hmm. types, which is very, mm -hmm. very interesting. Mm -hmm. And the other one is Unsafe Rust is not C, um, mm -hmm. which is from, from Jack O'Connor. It's one of my most favorite videos because what he does is he shows C code, he shows Rust code, and he is on Godbolt and shows the compiler output and how everything is is put into assembly code. Um, and he also shows very well how it's possible with Rust to make even faster code than we see because the compiler has more possibilities to optimize the output because of how the ownership model works. It's an incredible yeah. talk. I can really recommend it. I guess it's, um, um, it goes into the direction of, of what you said with, with how compare memory management and my plea to 
people in the audience who are really interested in that and want to do research, Rust Linz always has an open stage for you if you want to share your, your insights. Uh, I'm personally, I'm incredibly interested in that. And if you have something along the lines of how memory managed works compared to other programming languages, please come to Rust Linz. It's, it, this is your stage, definitely. Um, browsing through, um, browsing through the comments, I mostly see, I mostly actually see a lot of rings references, and <laughs> some concrete relation to your fan fiction. So it's <laughs> thank you already. So what okay. do you say? Are you prepared for next week? For I think I am. Yeah, I, I, I definitely got out from this uh, from this um, rehearsal what I wanted to get out. I got a better feeling for the. Um, for the timing, I have to rethink a little bit because I want to add the, the, the lifetimes. And uh, yeah, I, I made more mistake. That's uh, that, a stupid mistake. But whatever. Um, I want to say thank you for everybody who, who watched and who listened. Thank you, Stefan, for agreeing that I do that here. And I'm really looking forward to next week. I will have one talk about Rust and one about open AI, AI stuff, which will be Python, very different. So that will be oh, definitely cool. an interesting yeah. an interesting conference. Yeah. Yeah, cool. Yeah, that's interesting. Python also comes a little bit into my area, and I'm very surprised that it does. So I never would have never thought that this is yeah. the case. A friend of mine who is, a, who is a data scientist who currently looks, who uses Python a lot, he's currently looking into how you can easily create Rust code and use it from Python and try to convince him currently to give a talk it's, at Rust Lens. Yeah, it would be awesome. Yeah, they, they definitely should do it. Um, yep. it's, it's one of my most favorite things about Python is integrating it with Rust because mm -hmm. Py03 is such an amazing framework and I love doing that. So um, if, if somebody wants to do a talk about that, please do. Um, there's also we spoke about Rust Netherlands. Um, um, early on, um, somebody gave a talk about Pio3 at Rust Netherlands last year, and it was amazing. It's one of my most favorite talks from the conference. Also, a really good, um, good idea to check that out. Okay, folks, what do you say? Shall we close it down? I think we should. Cool. Uh, I want to thank Massi as well. Massi is still around, so I know that he wrote in the chat, and I see, I see his. Uh, he's still connected to StreamYard, so I want to thank Massi uh, as well for being with us and for sticking around for the entire time. Uh, please, everybody in the chat, give another round of applause for Rainer. He's, it's well-deserved. He did an amazing talk. Um, and um, I think it was a great start into the year. So I'm really looking forward to our next meetups and to the upcoming ones. Let's do another fantastic uh, year of Rust, folks. Righty. Oh, uh, Massi, shall we put you back online? Yes, oh, Massi. I'm here. Starting. Cool, fantastic. So it's 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 rare that somebody who speaks first sticks around for the entire time because they usually hop over to YouTube then and not not listen to it here. So thank you very much for sticking around until the end and thank you for your talk. It was amazing meeting oh, you again. Um, do we see each other at one of the upcoming RAS conferences? Yeah, for sure. Uh, it will be either I will, be, will get accepted as a speaker or I will need to have budget because there are too many conferences. And I don't know which ones you will be at and which ones we are we at. So I'm not sure we will cross, but it's possible. <laughs> cool, cool. Yeah, I hope to. So my goal is at one point in time to get to every Rust conference that is in Europe. I'm not sure if I will manage it, <laughs> but at least I'm at Rust Nation and at Rust Fest Zurich. So I'm, I'm already booked to those two. So let's see, let's see what the others will be. Alrighty. So everybody, Perfect. thank you very much. Have a thank fantastic you. start into the year. We'll see each other next time. Bye-bye. Have a nice bye -bye. evening. Bye. Bye.